Hey YouTube, I'm Mr. Terry, a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Acts video. All right, we are now going to do our part two of the Lemino video on the JFK assassination. If you have not seen the first part that I did, go down in the description and make sure to watch that first. Today we'll be picking up and starting with chapter six, which is titled The Men in the Windows. All right, we were starting to unfold some conspiracies or at least start to analyze them. And you know I'm ready to get back into conspiracy mode. All right, original video. So the original video I'm covering here is down below. Make sure you're supporting Lemino. If you like the style and this depth, got a bunch of other great videos. All right, let's get back to it. There we go. The man or the men in the windows. More than one. I mean, there were some onlookers from the. As previously book, mentioned, Arnold uh, Roland spotted a white man with a rifle in the westernmost window on the sixth floor about a quarter past twelve. But as late as five minutes before the shooting, Arnold observed an elderly black man leaning out the easternmost window on the same floor. He might have confused the sixth floor with the fifth. Two which shooters? John, Bonnie Williams and Harold Norman did indeed lean out the windows. In fact, they were the only black employees known to watch the motorcade from a floor above the first. Except they could hardly be described as elderly. Yeah. But then take a listen to this. It might be dark in there well, anyways. Describe with as much Anyone might look like that. As you can what that man looked like. It seemed to me an elderly black man. That is about all. I didn't pay very much attention mm. to him. This I mean, that question doesn't look was like Oswald either. Ronald a few minutes later, at which point his answer had dramatically changed. He was very thin, um, an elderly gentleman, bald or practically bald, very thin hair if he wasn't bald. Had on a plaid shirt. I think it was red and green. Did he Very say though color. that? That is why I remember it. He's describing Can somebody with a give gun. Us an estimate as to age? Fifty, possibly fifty-five or sixty. Can you give us an estimate as to height? Five, eight, five, ten in that neighborhood. He was very slender, very thin. Can you give us a more definite description as to complexion? Very dark or fairly dark. Not real dark compared to some black men, but fairly dark. Seemed like his face was either, I can't recall detail, but it was either very wrinkled or marked in some way. So See, I'm trying to think though, like, is he talk? I forgot, because again, I was watching the, the, the other part, it was, it was yesterday. But was he describing what he saw after, after the shot had been fired? Because even from that, like, I, I can't imagine you could get a real good description of anybody from there. They're in a room, in a building, far away. And this is after a shot would have been fired in the building. It's, it's going to be, sh you know, shaded and stuff like that. I don't know how you could be like, oh, the guy's 55 to 60 and could ever get ever get a height. Because if you're standing in the window, I mean, you can't really you don't get a frame of reference. It could be sitting down I feel like you this. This couldn't be like a very good. Um description and of course especially if it was from before if it was before the shot it's like you're not you're not taking in those kind of characteristics committing those kind of things to memory in the span of a few minutes arnold went from i didn't pay very much attention yeah, to describing a, the man's complexion that's what hair, I'm clothing age height build and even the blemishes on his face yeah that's that's kind of what i'm saying sometimes some people be are prone to exaggerate more than others and without in any way meaning to take away from the testimony of your husband as to what he saw in the building at the time just from your general experience do you feel you can rely on everything that your husband says right i don't feel that i can rely on everything anybody says <laughs> well this is really an unfair question for me to ask any wife about her husband and i am not asking it very trust correctly. nothing we're in the matrix my husband is prone to exaggerate does that answer it? I think it does. Is there anything else you want to add to that or not? Usually, his exaggerations are not concerned with anything other than himself. They're usually <laughs> to boost his ego. They usually say that he is really smarter than he she is, hates. or he's a better salesman than he is. She Something hates her like husband. That. She as hates him. As leading as that line of questioning was, Barbara was not alone in doubting her husband's credibility. Officials at two separate high schools attended by Arnold explicitly warned authorities not to trust everything he says. He was characterized as someone who would not hesitate to fabricate a story and not tell the truth regarding any to get attention. Just and he people didn't want and attention. Or exaggerated on multiple occasions when he testified. Yeah. Another witness who claimed to have seen a gunman in the book to Paul story. Was that was funny. Hey, by the way, remember, those aren't the real audio files. They said in the beginning that these, you know, were paid voice actors. So if you're trying to get like a full, <laughs> I don't know, like idea of these people. Carolyn Walter. Shortly before the arrival of the motorcade, Walter had seen a man with blonde or light brown hair in one of these windows on the fourth or fifth floor. 
she explicitly ruled at the sixth. It should be noted, however, that during the shooting, this window was closed with the blinds down, while this one, as you already know, was occupied by Bonnie Williams and Harold Norman. In any case, the light-haired man seen by Walter was holding a machine gun, and standing beside him was another man wearing a brown suit. Much like Arnold Rowland, Walter assumed the gunman was a presidential guard and refrained from telling the police. In fact, there's no evidence she told anyone of what she'd seen, not even the colleague with whom she watched the motorcade. In Walter's defense, two other witnesses recalled seeing a man with light or light brown hair on the fifth or sixth floor. Except they never saw a weapon, nor an accomplice. I mean, again, there was an this audience agree. there, the workers were hanging out there. Because it's a great view. I mean, Demons yeah, regarding the floors were, at least in part, due to the ground floor lacking visible windows. How do you know it was the sixth floor? Sixth floor rather than the fifth floor. I went with the FBI and I showed him the window, and I didn't count the bottom floor. You mean, the first time you gave a statement, you didn't count the bottom floor? That's right. Another source of confusion was the distinct visual difference between the seventh floor and the ones below. When you first glance at the building, you're thrown off a little as to the floors because there's a ridge. It almost looks like a structure added onto the top of the building, about one story above. So you have to recount. Not only that, but multiple witnesses described the sixth True, floor I mean, I as that. the second floor from the top. But in the chaos that ensued, it seems the tail end of that sentence was not always recorded. I wouldn't say it's the top floor, though. The second floor? That doesn't make sense. Amos Ewens is an another an curious witness there? because even though he never saw the gunman's face, he did see the top of his head. Somehow. What did you see in the building? I saw a ball spot on this man's head. Trying to look out the window, he had a ball spot on his head. I was looking at the ball spot. Oswald did not have a ball spot. He was thinning a bit in the front, but otherwise had a full head of hair. But the strength of Ewan's account is somewhat diminished by his inability to recall much of anything else. Could you tell whether he was a black gentleman or a white man? No, sir. Couldn't even tell that, but you have described that he had a ball spot in his head. Yes, sir. I could see the ball spot in his head. Now, could you tell what color hair he had? No, sir. Could you tell whether his hair was dark <laughs> or light? No, sir. <laughs> Long after the... I, I think uh, what this is all going to show you, because again, there were multiple people in the building watching it, but like how unreliable sometimes witness... Um, Evidence can be, especially if you're not directly encountering the individual and it's just something you see from far away in an instant. It'd be hard. It'd be hard. And then the more and, and then the longer the times pass, the more your mind's gonna like solidify what it thought it saw, and then it becomes more and more either gonna forget it completely or it's gonna solidify into something which may or may not even be accurate. The assassination, 15 years to be precise, a journalist working for the Dallas Morning News tracked on a man named Johnny Powell. Powell had supposedly seen two men fiddling with a scope on a rifle in the sniper's nest. He described their complexion as darker than white, but uh, that was about it. Once again, one has to wonder if he confused the gunmen with Jarman, Williams, and Norman on the floor below. The real shooter I mean, after out 15 there. years of silence, there's no telling how Powell's memory could have been distorted. A good example of such distortion is Richard Carr. A few minutes before the shooting, the Carr like had been castle. standing roughly here when ah. he spotted a man on the seventh floor of the book depository, all the way over here. Yeah. Nope. Nope. The man was white and wore a hat, glasses, and sport coat. In the immediate aftermath of the shooting, Carr returned to ground level and caught sight of what he believed to be the same man now trotting south on Houston. He made a left turn right about here before being picked up by a station wagon. You know, with 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 an event such as this, too, there are some people that are going to love the attention and love the uh, just like being able to be a part of it. You know, those kind of people that just if something's going on. They, they want to be a part of it, like no matter what. And I wonder if that's happening with some of these people. They're like, hey, I'll, you know, I'll act with conviction because then they'll give me attention. By 1969, however, Carr's story had notably changed. The man with a sport coat had now been standing on the fifth floor, not the seventh. After the shooting, Mr. Sport Coat had emerged from behind the book depot story, accompanied by two other men. They too had been picked up by a separate station wagon before speeding away. 
It's unclear how Carr is supposed to have seen all of this, considering what he told the FBI back in 64. It's the getaway vehicle. Carr advised that from his location on the steel structure of the new courthouse building, it would have been impossible for him to observe the lower floors and entrance of the book depository, and that from yeah, that his position, angle. he could only see the top floor and the roof. I mean, wouldn't wouldn't all this been happening in moments of chaos too? Like the president just got shot, and people heard that stuff. And there's a ton of people there scattering around. It's so hard. It's like <laughs> now we have video everywhere, and that helps. But not in six. First defense, James Worrell had seen a man emerge from the rear entrance of the book depository about three minutes after the shooting. This man also wore a sport coat and headed south in Houston. Except the man seen by Carr was kind of stocky and wore a hat, while the man seen by Worrell had a slender build and was hatless. Besides, anyone connected with the shooting, leaving via the rear entrance, would surely have headed north, not towards the scene of the crime. As if that was not enough, two other witnesses, James Romack and George Rackley, stood roughly here for several minutes after the mm. shooting. Both of them paid special attention way. to the rear entrance of the building. They're just standing there. Between. Mr. Romack stated that from the time he heard the shots, Railroads. he had looked toward the book depository and had under his immediate observation the loading dock and the back door. He stated he is positive that no one came out of this door or out of the loading dock doors. Could you see the back door of the Texas School Book Depository? Yes. Were you looking towards that direction? Yes, sir. About how long did you keep your eyes fixed over there? Oh, I would say five minutes anyhow, probably ten. I was looking up that way at all times. Did you see any people leave the Texas School Book Depository by way of the rear exit? No, sir. Did you see any people Who running was? north on Houston Street? N no, sir. What was Oswald's exit? Unfortunately, conflicting accounts were not limited to the Book Depot story. Among the hundreds of witnesses in the vicinity of Dealey Plaza, Nothing was as disputed as the number Young and Hill. origin of the gunshots. Yeah, Governor is. Connolly was holding his stomach. And the yeah. shots were almost simultaneously, weren't they? Yes, yeah, sir, they were probably 10 seconds apart. the third Hill. shot? I didn't hear a I, I don't recall a third shot. There may have been. My boy I, I, we hit, my family hit the ground, and I don't recall a third shot. Uh, I just couldn't, I'm not certain of that. I do know I heard two shots. Yeah, I heard three. I know you heard three. Well, yeah, I said to Jerry, the report said two, shot, right? I said, my God, those are gunshots. The official report, Warren report. All right, well, like, after watching that first, there, that section, section six, it doesn't seem anything came to light um, at all that, like, proves Oswald or disproves it. It's just a ton of conjecture and, um, contrasting testimonies that way so not much kind of there nothing, nothing quite tingling my my hat right now conspiracy bones come on i want something I want something no one knows dirty exactly info how many something. spectators were in or near Dili plaza at the time of the assassination well over 200 were at some point questioned by a combination of authorities journalists and others Attempts have been made to consolidate the various accounts, and it's clear from all such attempts that the majority of witnesses heard three shots. What's a bit less clear is the source of the explosions. The gunman was either placed in the vicinity of the book depository, marked here in red, or an area west of the building, marked in green, known as the Grassy Knoll. Alright, let's take a look at this real quick. So, attempts to assess direction of gunshots based on ear witness testimony. So... John McAdams, 112 witnesses. A lot of book depositories, so a lot kind of in the first one. The Grassy Knoll. So the Grassy Knoll, at least in one of them, got a lot. Grassy Knoll, yeah. I mean, the thing is, too, there's buildings all around. There's going to be an echo there, because there's other big buildings. Um, to identify something that loud, which it would be, probably be hard to, uh, quite hard to get direction of it, especially with so many people around. And again, only things that can reflect off of. So, I mean, it's it's varied for sure. This is brings on the whole glass, grassy knoll thing. There was a second, potentially a second shooter. Man, that would have taken some insane coordination because they just happen right within a couple seconds of each other. But as you can see from these pie charts, the assessment of ear witness testimony is highly susceptible to bias. It's a surprisingly subjective exercise that can lead to widely different results. 
Nevertheless, there were a substantial number of witnesses who pointed to the grassy knoll located roughly here, and many of them were scattered throughout the plaza. To give you some examples, August Campbell was standing near the front entrance of the book depository, yet believed the shots had come from the grassy knoll. Meanwhile, Marilyn Sitzman was standing on the grassy knoll, yet believed the shots had come from the book depository. Standing beside back Campbell was a woman way. named Geraldine Reed, who believed the shots had come from the book depository. Standing by the curb in front of Sitzman was William Newman, who believed the shots had come from the grassy knoll. One might therefore conclude that there must have been two assassins, one in the book depository and one on the grassy knoll. Is that, is that where yeah. that conspiracy comes from? Is the, the multiple testimonies of where the shot came from? That I didn't know. The countless authors and even the congressional investigation the have done precisely that. Now, the scope of this video is not nearly exhaustive enough for me to attempt any conclusions regarding a second gunman, but I do want to leave you with this. You might have seen these unlabeled blue slices before. Well, that's yeah, how many that? witnesses heard gunshots coming from multiple directions. That is to say, Echo. next to no one did. All Dallas, the shots big city. came either from the east or west, not both. There'd be multiple echoes coming too with the shots firing so quickly, right? Mr. Campbell believed the noise came from away from the book depository. This illusion, he explained, may have been due to the sound bouncing off the building and other objects in the vicinity. Was my Campbell original thought. was far from alone in being deceived by the pronounced echoes of the gunshots. Where did the noises or shots sound to you like they came from? It was hard to tell because they had an echo, you know? There was actually two explosions with each one. There was yeah. the shot Ooh. and then the echo Ooh. from it. So it was hard to tell. There was too much reverberation. There was an echo which gave me a sound all over. And it was so high In other words, up. That square is kind of, it had a sound all over. The sounds came either from up against the school depository building or near the mouth of the triple underpass. I had worked in this watchtower for some 10 or 12 years and was there during the time they were renovating the school depository building. And I had noticed at that lot. time the similarity of sounds occurring in either of those two locations. There is a reverberation which takes place from either location. This auditory illusion was not a fluke. Not only did the building surrounding Dili Plaza act as an echo chamber, but even experienced hunters can struggle to pinpoint the number and origin of gunshots by sound alone. Here's a quote from a book on that very topic, published a few years before the assassination. Little credence should be put in what anyone says about a shot or even the number of shots. These things coming upon a person suddenly are generally extremely inaccurately recorded in their memory. One of the authors asked one deer hunter last fall how many shots another hunter less than 100 yards away had fired. The answer was five. Actually, only two shots were fired. Employees That's something I noticed when, like, like, when I was taking, like, deer hunting when I was a kid and stuff like that is you go on a, a canyon and deer hunting is often done with hills and stuff and yeah it echoes like crazy it could sound like a bunch of shots paul story were no less confused about the gunshots than the spectators outside to give you some examples on the first floor eddie piper heard three shots that appeared to come from inside the building on the third floor edna case and sandra ellison heard nothing meanwhile stephen wilson on the same floor heard three shots came from the west on the fourth floor, Elsie Dorman, multiple shots came from this building across the street. Victoria Adams, three shots from the west. Mary Hollis, three shots inside the building. But some employees not only heard the shots, but could literally feel the explosions shake the building. Could you tell where the shots were coming from? Yes, sir. They came from inside the building. How do you know that? because the building vibrated from the result of the explosion coming in. Did you know they were shots at the time? Yes, sir. They sounded almost like cannon shots. They were so terrific. They're loud. Much Rifle like leaving like behind on the second floor, Bonnie People Williams always underestimate could feel how the loud guns actually the floor. are. It sounded to Williams as though the shots had been fired from the floor above. His colleague, James Jarman, initially thought the shots had come from somewhere below, but then changed his mind and agreed with Williams. Harold Norman, meanwhile, heard far more than gunshots. Just after the president Harold. passed by, I heard a shot. And several seconds later, I heard two more shots. I knew that the shots had come from directly above me, and I could hear the expended cartridges fall to the floor. 
I could also hear the bolt action of the rifle. The explosions shook the building, and a piece of loose plaster or dirt was dislodged from the ledge above be hard, and though. struck Williams in the head. But, I mean, Meanwhile, it can't spectators be loud. in the streets below could see them leaning out the windows, looking up at the sixth floor. I just looked straight up ahead of me, which would have been looking at the school book depository, and I noticed two black men in a window, straining to see directly above them, and my eyes followed right up to the window above them, and I saw the rifle, or what looked like a rifle. Frightened and somewhat entranced by the pandemonium outside, the three men remained on the fifth floor for several minutes. I mean, yeah, there are Meanwhile, the apparent assassin upstairs guys was now in a race against time. Did you hear anything upstairs at all? No, sir. I didn't hear anything. Any footsteps? No, sir. Probably. The reason we didn't hear anything is because, you know, after the shots, we were running too. And that was making a louder noise. Why didn't you go up to the sixth floor? Why would you? I really don't know. We just never did think about it. Maybe it's because we were frightened. Why would you, though? Right? Getting, you're getting out of there. All right, next chapter. The escape. Okay. I'm interested in this. They get into Oswald's escape and stuff like that. I mean, everyone... Every, everyone in and out of the buildings is probably going to look like they're escaping, right? Because gunshot, should gunshots are fire. You're going you're gonna to scatter. All right, let's check this out. When the shooting began, motorcycle policeman Marion Baker had just made a right turn from Main Street to Houston. Baker recognized the explosions as gunfire and could see a flock of pigeons fluttering above two buildings further up ahead. Baker made a split-second decision and headed for the book depot story. Once inside, he was greeted by Roy Truly. Truly directed Baker to the elevators, but neither was available. He pressed the button while shouting up the elevator shaft for someone upstairs to close the gate. No response. Instead, they began running up the stairs. Elevator won't work otherwise. Safety. As I came out to the second floor there, Mr. Truly was ahead of me. And as I come out, I was kind of scanning, you know, the, the rooms. And I caught a glimpse of this man walking away from this. I happened to see him through this window in this door. I don't know how come I saw him, but I had a glimpse of him coming down there. Where was he coming from, do you know? No, sir. All I seen of him was a glimpse of him go away from me. What did you do? I hollered at him at that time and said, come here. He turned and walked right straight back to me. What did you say to him? I didn't get anything out of him. Mr. Truly had come up to my side here and I turned to Mr. Truly and I says, do you know this man? That says, he my grandpa here? used to say. And he said, yes. And it I says. turned immediately and went on out up the stairs. The man whom Baker and Truly encountered in the second floor lunchroom was none other than Lee Harvey Oswald. The encounter was brief, lasting no more than 30 seconds. Oswald appeared calm and failed to evoke suspicion, so Truly and Baker left them in the lunchroom Where's the gun? and proceeded up the stairs. Where's the gun at? Where's the gun at? You ditch it? Wearing it on a shoulder? I mean, that would have been obvious right away here. Well, I feel like I like in, with this cuff, I, I'm not able to add a lot of like historical context. I mean, this, now this is truly feeling just like a reaction and I, I try to do better than that. But uh, hopefully, you know, you're enjoying just I, I'm just trying to say this, you know, the thoughts that are in my head here. Um, I think a lot of the context I really uh, gave last video too for Oswald's background and, and um, JFK's background and stuff like that. So. Still gonna try as much as I can. Some time searching the roof, but there was no assassin to be found. Down by the main entrance, Geraldine Reed was still trying to process what had just occurred. She decided to return to her office on the second floor of the building. Here, about two minutes after the shooting, Reed became the last known person to have seen Oswald inside the book depository. I kept walking and I looked up and Oswald was coming in the back door of the office. I met him by the time I passed my desk by several How feet. How did he look? I told him, I said, oh, the president has been shot, but maybe <laughs> they didn't say? hit him. He mumbled something to me. I kept walking. Like, he did too. I didn't pay any attention to what he said because I had no thoughts of him oh, having any connection with the president's been shot? Because he was very calm. 
Martin. Oswald is then presumed to have taken the front stairs and on his way out the main entrance encountered someone looking for a phone. There are at least two candidates for who this person might have been, but Oswald seems to have Someone's pointed like, out the phone inside the building. I got a report. I got a report that the president's been shot. I want to be the one to call it in. Before blending into the chaos outside, he was next observed boarding a bus a few blocks east of Elm. How do we know that? But whatever. Nearly four the months after the assassination, incredible. Truly and Baker participated in a crude reconstruction of the shooting to time their movements. The experiment was repeated twice. On the first attempt, it took them one minute and 30 seconds to reach the second floor lunchroom, then one minute and 15 seconds. These time trials were primarily conducted to determine whether Oswald could have fired the shots from the sixth floor and still made it, made it down to the second in time for his encounter with Truly and Baker. Uh, didn't they say in the previous video he had... Is he When he went up the elevator, he told the person going down that to, to close it, right? The, uh, the lower floor. So I think it was set up for him to just be able to go right into the elevator, right? Um, and be able to just bail. After all, if there wasn't enough time, Oswald could not have been the assassin. And the buses were just like running like normal. Like it's been three minutes after you think like the buses would, I don't know, stop. Like, I don't know what protocol is for that. A bunch of different routes were tested. And while Oswald could theoretically have taken one of the elevators or even the fire escape, in practice, there wasn't enough time. You do not think the assassin used any of the elevators at any time to get from the sixth to the second floor? You mean after the shooting? No, sir. He just could not, because those elevators, I saw myself, were both on the fifth floor. He sounds like lucky. They were both even. From King the of the only Hill. other <laughs> means of descent was the stairway. A stand-in for the gunman trotted down from the sixth floor to the second in one minute and 18 seconds. Then, at a slightly faster pace, in one minute and 14 seconds. There was just enough time. Okay, so either it's way. It's therefore possible that Oswald stopped on the second floor, perhaps upon hearing Truly shouting up the elevator shaft, and attempted to hide in the lunchroom mere seconds ahead of Truly and Baker's arrival. Mm -hmm. But it's not quite that simple, because Good Oswald around, was not the only person using the stairway to escape the building. stopped he tucked in the chairs he hates them the stairway okay so any enlightening things coming out of that i guess it just seems it just it seems like it was plausible that um oswald could be up there up high in the building and then make his way down so not tingling the hat yet no, no tingle in there i wanted to Come on. As previously mentioned, Victoria Adams watched a motorcade from an office on the fourth floor of the Book Depot story. Within 30 seconds of the shooting, Adams ran down the stairs to the first floor along with her colleague, Sandra Stiles. When you got to the bottom of the first floor, did you see anyone there as you entered the first floor from the stairway? Yes, sir. Who did you see? Mr. William Shelley and Billy Lovelady. Now, what did you do after you Great encountered name, Mr. There. Shelley and Mr. Lovelady? I said I believed the president was shot. Do you remember what they said? Nothing. Then what did you do? I proceeded out to the Houston Street Dock. There are two significant problems with Adam's account. The first when they eventually go to trial, I mean, I guess, you know, whatever you call it. I mean, Oswald's not there and get that stuff. They had to have really flushed out all of these people, right? I mean, they're they're showing the quotes from the um, from investigations and stuff, but. You know, you'd think they'd be rigorous with these people. First being that she and Stiles supposedly left the fourth floor within 30 seconds of the shooting and then ran down the stairs to the first. This would place them in approximate sync with Oswald, descending from the sixth floor to the second. Now, as you were running down the stairs, did you encounter anyone? Not during the actual running down the stairs, no sir. Did you hear anyone using the stairs? No sir. But okay, perhaps Oswald was a few flights above, and his footsteps were drowned out by their own. This would mean that Stiles and Adams left the fourth floor mere seconds ahead of Oswald's arrival, reached the ground floor mere seconds ahead of Roy Truly and Marion Baker's ascent, before encountering William Shelley and Billy Lovelady right about here. But this is when problem number two makes an entrance. 
When the president was shot, Shelley and Lovelady stood on the front steps of the book depository. They spent several minutes roaming about outside before returning to the building. And that's the problem. How did Stiles and Adams encounter Shelley and Lovelady within seconds of the shooting if it took them several minutes to return to the building? Who did you see on the first floor after returning to the How book could they know these timings so much? You know what I mean? Of what was going on at three minutes after the shooting and then five minutes or ten minutes. Uh, stuff like that. Is it just, again, based on, on testimony? Because everyone's perception of time is, is always so different. I saw a girl, but I wouldn't swear to it. It's Vicky. What is her full name? I wouldn't know. Vicky Adams? I believe so. I Would you say know. it was Vicky you saw? We weren't allowed to I know. couldn't swear. Where was the girl? I don't remember what place she was, but I remember seeing a girl and she was talking to Shelly or saw Shelly or something. Shelly could recall no such incident. Presuming that Lovelady was correct and Shelly had a lapse of memory, it's possible their encounter with Stiles and Adams occurred minutes rather than seconds after the shooting. After all, Adams could have been mistaken. This scenario implies that Oswald made his escape. Yeah, what does this imply? Truly and Baker went upstairs, and then several minutes later, Stiles and Adams left the building. But it's not quite that simple. Watching the motorcade alongside Stiles and Adams was their supervisor, Dorothy Garner. Miss Garner stated this morning that after Miss Adams went downstairs, she, Miss Garner, saw Mr. Truly and the policeman come up. Not only does this account corroborate that of Adams, meaning they left within seconds, not minutes, but it implies that Garner was in a position to observe the stairway from somewhere on the fourth floor. You think they're trying to, I mean, this is trying to hypothesize, I guess, that's the right word, that there are other people that could be, um, you know, like suspects? In some way like what does this do for the story and i guess if we're going to just take the presumption that all of this was was and was only oswald does this in any way like co corroborate or like dismiss him almost like an alibi uh i'm not seeing that yet if i'm missing something big here uh let me know in spite of this garner made no mention of seeing oswald scampering down the stairs between Stiles and Adams' departure and Truly and Baker's arrival. What makes this conflict so difficult to resolve is that neither Stiles nor Garner were called to testify. We have but a few brief statements of what they witnessed. Mm. All we know about Sandra Stiles is that she went down the stairs with Adams. Did it happen within seconds of the shooting? We don't know. Did she see or hear anyone else while running down the stairs? We don't know. Did she encounter Shelley Wait, and Lovely nothing notable the first said. We don't know. Authorities appear to have presumed Adams unreliable and then ignored the witnesses <clears throat> who could have easily refuted or confirmed that presumption. A simple reenactment like the one granted Truly and Baker could have gone a long way to resolve this issue. But that never happened. Many decades after the assassination, author Barry Ernest was able to track down Sandra Stiles, Barry? Dorothy Garner, and Victoria Adams. The whole book about this? Wrote a whole book about it? The girl on the stairs, my search for a missing witness to the assassination of John F. Kennedy. So in a lot of ways, maybe they're just trying to find out if other people worked with him or. Oh, no, I mean, what would, what would Oswald need of these people, really? Like. To deny that he was there. Styles confirmed what that she and Adams left the window within seconds of the shooting but she doesn't explicitly say they left the fourth floor within seconds. In any case, as they moved quickly down the stairs, she heard no footfall apart from their own. Garner confirmed she never witnessed the descent of Oswald, despite seeing Truly and Baker heading upstairs. Adams went a bit further and accused investigators of tampering with their testimony. I'm beginning to wonder Ooh. if the Shelley and Lovelady encounter was inserted into my testimony later. I remember saying to a fairly big black man inside the building, right near the loading dock, right after I got down the stairs, that I thought the president may have been shot. Okay. Sandra Stiles apparently told Ernest something similar. A few people were milling around on the first floor. One was a black man. Shelley and Lovelady were definitely not on the first floor when we got there. The only black employees who could have possibly made it to the rear stairway in time were Carl Jones, Roy Lewis, Eddie Piper, and Troy West. 
What you see here are their approximate positions at the time of the shooting, but during the seconds and minutes that followed, only Piper is known to have paid any attention to the stairs in the back. As soon as the shooting began, Piper crossed the first floor to get a better view of a clock. He remained in roughly this location until he observed Trudy and Baker running up the stairs. Had anybody come down the steps before Truly and Baker went up the steps? No, sir. Did Vicky Adams come down before Truly and Baker went up the steps? No, sir. <laughs> no, sir. She didn't do it. Oswald Remember didn't come down James at all. Remember and George Rackley? I mean, I wouldn't blame you if you don't. There's like a hundred different names to keep track of, but they were the ones yeah, who I, failed to I'm spot not doing well with the names looked at all. via the rear entrance for several minutes after the shooting. Well, the thing is, according to both Styles and Adams, they left the book depository via the rear entrance upon reaching the first floor. So if Romack and Rackley are to be believed, then once again, the descent of Styles and Adams must have taken place minutes rather than seconds after the shooting. Not only that, but when Sandra Styles was contacted by another researcher, she apparently expressed great uncertainty regarding the stairwell descent and thought it might in fact have occurred a couple of minutes after the shooting. So I don't the time know line. what to make of all this. The conspiracy crowd will, of course, amplify the more suspicious elements, while those who support the official narrative will focus on that which discredits Adams. But ultimately, we don't know the exact time Stairways are smaller than I thought. It's difficult enough to pin down the minute One by minute time. chronology. Once you get down to seconds, there's a lot of guesswork at play. The time trials by Truly and Baker gives us a rough estimate, but that's not books, cast though, in stone. To avoid. They could have easily been a bit faster, a bit slower. So too could have Shelley, Lovelady, Garner, Stiles, Adams, and Oswald. Would you say that the reconstruction that we did on March the 20th was a minimum or a maximum time? Oh, I would say that would be the minimum time. Mm. We did everything that I did that day, and this would be the minimum time, because I'm sure that I, you know, it took me a little longer. I must also mention that we don't know much about the layout of the fourth floor beyond this crude schematic. If the other floors are any indication, much of this space was occupied by bookshelves and tall stacks of boxes. Yeah, this is significant there, because right? Dorothy Garner never actually saw Stiles and Adams enter the stairway. She only heard footsteps of what she presumed to be them running down the stairs. I'd still like to hear the... All right, I think we'll we'll stop it at this point. Um, here's my final thoughts, though. Don't go anywhere. You know, as I continue to watch this, um, you know, these these sections, it just makes me like wish so much that Oswald hadn't been assassinated, like when he was when he was right by uh, Jack Ruby, uh, because there's so much more that would have been known. Also, Jack Ruby ends up dying uh, <laughs> days after that too, and never really got to fully question him either he gave a statement and i'm sure they'll get to this stuff after about why he did it but um yeah so i mean what is what is unfolding here with what they're presenting here um i'm not sure what it does as far as implicating people um here because everything it sounds like is is pretty plausible um you know, at least by some testimonies. I mean, they, they keep people keep saying like, yeah, that was enough time to, to get out or it wasn't enough time, but it's all, it all seems like within the realm of possibility. So nothing is really swinging, I think, in any directions out here. But nevertheless, um, it's a lot of information going on. But again, I was kind of saying this earlier about how this, this kind of testimony, this kind of stuff is hard and to get reliable, uh, reliable. And then especially when, people are all saying different things. I mean, we've, it's been nothing but that since we saw this about how many people there were. Was he white? Was he black? Was he tall? Was he short? Which floor was he on, right? Did you pass somebody? Did you think you heard somebody pass by you? So difficult to get anything on this. So we'll, <coughs> uh, we'll see as this keeps going. So this next chapter is chapter 10. It's called uh, The Sniper's Nest. So maybe we'll see a little bit more. Obviously, we're gonna know about Things like uh, the gun, if the gun was found, are there shells, are there, uh, again, the angles and all that stuff. So I think that will start to be really, really interesting, especially when trying to pinpoint the location of the shot and the potential of other shooters or something like that. So I think this will hopefully uh, this will keep getting interesting here. So 
we are uh, past the halfway point now. So we probably have um, probably two more parts. So I'm thinking this will probably be in total, probably four parts. So um, we can kind of call it sort of halfway as far as an amount of uh, videos covering this go. So anyway, stay tuned for that. I'm assuming, again, you saw section one. Um, look out for uh, section three. Hope to get out soon. I want to get these out really quick, back to back to back. So we can, of course, get on to some of our other content. So, all right. Well, hopefully you liked my insights in there and some of the stuff that I was talking about and going through um, as well. Try to give you guys, again, more context to what's going on as this unfolds as well. So, all right. Uh, again, original video by Lemono down below, credible creator. And with that, we'll see you next time. Bye.